So if we look at the scene here that I created in a previous video, it looks quite decent. The art style is coherent, and we have some parallax going on. But if we stop moving the character, everything feels dead, and we might as well be looking at an image of the scene. So we're going to try and fix that. We'll be looking at animations, shaders, and particle effects, and discuss how to use these methods to make your scene come to life. Almost all games add some form of movement to avoid creating the feeling of a static environment, and it doesn't really matter how complex or simple the game looks. From games like an untitled story all the way to Hollow Knight, it is very difficult to find games with a scene or sequence that doesn't have any movement. The only game I can think of is Jump King. The most consistent method of adding this movement is by using an idle animation. It does enough to avoid the game looking like an image, but it's not enough to make the environment come to life. So to add that movement to the environment, games will generally use particle effects or shaders. Almost all games do this because of the relative small investment it takes to get a decent result. So we see games like Thomas Was Alone, which doesn't really have an environment to speak of, still have some small particles moving in the background. In this case, you'll obviously have to apply different particles to each scene, so we see some games that apply movement directly to the screen using shaders. Games like Hollow Knight, Tales of Iron, and Ghost Song all seem to use a grain shader which makes the scene slightly more gritty. A game that takes this even further is Dead Cells, which has implemented some type of fog shader on the screen. Unlike Thomas Was Alone, games like Hollow Knight and Dead Cells don't rely on these shaders to add movement. They are effects that add small sprinkles of movement to an already immersive scene, and to give the environment a sense of space. The shader in Dead Cells, for instance, helps the environment feel somewhat toxic and unclean. This is, in my opinion, a really important way to add life in your game to give the player a sense of the weather of the environment. So let's explore this a bit further and talk about setting the mood of the environment. The first thing we can look at, and perhaps the easiest, is to just add random particles. They don't have to represent anything in particular, but they still help to give the area a sense of place. Hollow Knight does this consistently. The particles themselves are generally quite odd and random, even their past don't entirely make sense. It's almost like they have a life of their own. You'll see me consistently add these type of particles in my own scenes. At the very least, they can help the area feel mystical. But we will generally see particles simulate something that the player has knowledge of, such as rain, with particles falling straight down, or combined with wind particles and almost flying sideways. These type of wind particles are really common, in part because they are a good way of setting the mood, but also because they on top of adding movement can be really useful in order to improve readability. Like here in Ghost Song, where it generally feels like this fog here is there to make the place seem desolate. But if you think about the placement of the fog, it consistently lights up all the platforms, increasing the contrast of it without really bringing that much attention to itself. These wind particles are generally quite slow and large and work best together with smaller particles that can help add a sense of the environment, either by floating erratically in the air or like in Tales of Iron, where they rapidly fly up from the ground to give a feeling of a smoldering timber. Similarly, I've mentioned in the past how small particles really can be useful to elevate light effects, which we can see here, or in my own implementation here. But we don't only need to rely on particle effects to give a sense of the environment. We can see down here in Ghost Song how there is this strange wobble in the walls, which is an imaginative way to create a sense of an alien world. After all, a wall that wobbles would feel pretty alien to most of us. But a similar effect can be seen here in the Iconoclast, where the wobble is used to simulate the diffraction of light that you can get when it is extremely hot. It looks pretty cool and adds a little bit of movement to an environment that is generally quite static. Of course, we can also combine several of these effects, like in The End is Nigh, where we have particle effects to simulate the rain, but then also a small shader behind it to add a small wobble. Okay, so let's talk about my favorite method to add life and movement, to give a sense of the materials in your scene. After all, if we look at a scene like this, while this indeed looks like a bush, it doesn't quite feel like a bush unless we add that movement that can come about when a bush rustles in the wind. So we can see a slightly more complex texture shader that makes the leaves rustle in Tales of Iron, or quite a simple implementation in Shippo, where some plants swing back and forth. This shader in Shippo is simple to implement, but still adds quite a bit just from this simple swing back and forth. The main downside I see with using shaders to simulate the material is that it generally doesn't feel that organic. So if we look at this shader, which is similar to the one used in Shippo, it makes the grass strand swing perfectly back and forth. A bit too perfect. And with this asset, it almost looks like a pendulum. We can make it feel a bit more realistic by also making the grass bend a bit, almost like the wind is blowing the top of the grass slightly stronger than the bottom. But it still feels a bit too perfect. And in a sense it actually is. After all, this shift is calculated using sine and cosine, so we get this perfect continuous movement. So what other options do we have? Well, we can try and draw an animated shift by hand. 
we could redraw the asset and make something like three frames. Or we could even do kind of what the shader is doing and warp the asset slightly. But since we're still only making like three frames, when we put it in the game and compare the two, the animated movement feels slightly more homely and well hand drawn. And you might have to adjust the type of asset you make depending on the method you use. Hand animating this movement will probably just look off, whereas adding a shader to this type of asset runs the risk of making it too obvious that it's just being shifted. Similarly, we can use different methods to simulate water. A very common method to simulate water is to add a shader that implements both a wobble and a reflection. It honestly looks pretty cool, so I can see why it's common to do. I personally sometimes feel like it brings too much attention to itself, so I've opted to get a very different look of water, which only has that reflective glisten, and this is done using particle effects only. Regardless of it, unlike a bush, which still looks like a bush even when it's just a single static frame, water won't quite make sense unless we have some movement. And some assets will have the absolute opposite problem, where they don't make sense with added movement. You generally don't want to overdo the movement, both for the sake of performance, but also because movement generally reduces readability. So varying your asset types in your scene can be quite important. So for instance, we can take this scene and add shaders to the bushes and leaves, and then animate the flowers slightly. But then the grass hills, trees, and rocks are all static elements. It's just about enough to make the scene feel a bit more alive, while not overdoing it. I'll also add here that we generally only need to add these effects on the foreground elements, and we can keep the background elements static without the player noticing it. But sometimes we really want the player to notice something in the background. And here, movement is an excellent way to achieve this. So this might for instance be because you want to bring attention to narrative details. If we look at this area in Tales of Iron, we can see the mice shaking in the background. This is partly conveying that they're scared, something that might be difficult to signal without that movement, but this could have also gone unnoticed if there wasn't that added movement. If we look at a lot of these scenes in Tales of Iron, like the city burning or smoldering, the rain, the quiet rebuilding of the city, think about how much of it really relies on the movement of the scene. Without these effects, they couldn't really convey the shifts in the narrative, and so while you can get away with slightly more static environments in games like Thomas Was Alone, some games I think demands movement in order to be executed properly, which neatly segues us into the next important use case of movement, conveying mechanics. This is possibly one of the most common reasons to add movement in your game. If you have an object or thing that the player needs to interact with, it could be anything from picking up a coin or needing the player to pull a lever. Regardless of the game, you will generally have to pick up items, shoot enemies, or get power-ups. And one of the easiest and most consistent methods to signal to the player that an object is not part of the aesthetics of the game is to add movement and life to it. Which is why we see games with little to no movement like Jumper still consistently add movement to interactable objects to aid in signaling the mechanics of the game. Similarly, we can use this movement to naturally inform the player of how to use the mechanic. As an example, we can look at Shippo. This water fountain naturally tells the player that the water will push you up. And we can see this similar type of communication with wind pushing you up in a lot of the games. This type of movement can also be used to signal bounces, such as on these mushrooms in Hollow Knight where the particle effect signals that you should interact with the mushroom, and the bounce helps you give that visual feedback when you bounce on it. But do we only want to add interactability to aid mechanics? Well, not necessarily. It's frankly also an excellent method to make the world itself feel just a bit more responsive. So we can see this in Shippo, where if we walk into the grass, it rustles a bit, something Hollow Knight has also implemented. Similarly, we can see in Hollow Knight that when you are walking on the grass, then you get these grass particles flying up. And when you walk on a rock, then it's more of a dust up. And we sometimes see a combination of this, where we can, for instance, walk into these, they rustle, and if we hit them, then they get destroyed and we get some particle effects to illustrate the pieces of grass flying everywhere. And this type of thing can even be as simple as in Haiku, where you jump on this platform, it bounces a bit, it really makes no difference in gameplay, but just kind of feels nice. There's a bit of a subsection of this movement and responsiveness that relates to juice, but it is quite an extensive topic that I would have to cover in a different video. So what methods should you use? I personally would say that having random particles flying around is an incredible return on investment. Even simple particle fix tend to add a lot to your game, and you don't have to spend more than 10 minutes to set them up. Similarly, I would say that learning how to make a few simple shaders can be really useful. They can be somewhat tricky to get into, and if you don't know where to start, the Book of Shaders is quite a nice place if you want to learn the basics. Also look at some shaders at Godot Shaders if you use Godot. Being able to write it once and then just apply it to the textures you have 
makes them long term be quite a neat investment. And as you can see with quite a bit of these texture shaders, they really offer a unique look, which really isn't achievable any other way. Which leads us into the last topic of animations. I would say that these can be an incredible time sink. They're somewhat of a necessity when it comes to your character, bosses and enemies. But when it comes to the environment, I would say that simple animations of flowers don't take too long to make. There are definitely cool things you can do with it that don't necessarily take too much time, such as adding insects to your scene. But I would generally start with shaders and particle effects, especially if you don't feel comfortable drawing, just on the basis that animation generally takes a long time to do. With that said, I only briefly went over how you can use these things to add movement, but I didn't really go into how conceptually to do this stuff. So I'll probably try to add a video for each of these topics in the future. Particle effects, shaders, and environment animations. And if I have, you should be able to see one here. Thanks for watching.